Hi guys, welcome again to the fourth episode in creating a third person controller. Okay, so we're back in this project. We've been working with tweens and we've been swapping the camera alignment. As you can see, now I've got a button that can make us swap between different sides. And this is really handy in case you're fighting somebody and you're against this wall and now you can't really aim because you're like situated directly behind yourself. You can press that button and you can pop the camera out on the other side. And then if you wanted to, you can pop back in. But this is just a quality of life thing. It's fairly present in a lot of modern day third person shooters. Now let's look at aiming. Quick favor before we go, hit the like and subscribe if you find this helpful. Want the whole course right away? Support me on Patreon or join as a channel member for instant access. If subscriptions aren't your thing, grab the full course on Udemy and own it forever. Links in the description. Let's get coding. Aiming is... I mean, it's one of those things with third person shooters, we're going to do it with the camera. We're not going to do any kind of overlay or anything like that. Um, we are just going to zoom in right down uh, close to the, to the weapon so that you're closer to it and you can see further, which is pretty easy. The first thing that we need to do is obviously set up uh, an input. So we'll set up an input for aim. I'm going to map this to a mouse button this time. So I could click this little thing here, right mouse button, and we'll close that. So we've got the aim and essentially what we're just going to do is go if event dot is action pressed aim, we will do some kind of aiming. We haven't created the function yet. And then also if event dot is action released aim, then we'll do something here as well. We'll exit the aiming, right? So we'll create a new function here. We'll call it enter aim and it'll return void. Pretty much, we're just gonna do a very similar action as that we've done before. With tweens, the pattern is pretty much the same every time, except we're gonna explore a couple of different options here that we haven't touched on yet. So the very first thing that we're gonna do is the same as before. We're gonna say if camera tween, uh, camera tween kill, so that we're not operating on anything else. And then we'll create the tween, camera tween equals get tree dot create tween. And this time we're going to add something a little bit different. We're going to set parallel and default is true. So we can just call that. Uh, we don't actually have to pass in true. You can, obviously you can make it false, but by default it's true. If parallel is true, the tween is appended after this method by default with run simultaneously as opposed to sequentially. And the tweener is added right before this. So you can just see in the example here, dot set parallel. You can also append that to the end of the function. So I've done it here like this, but um, if you wanted to, you can also say camera tween dot set parallel. That's totally fine. Okay. And with aiming, we're actually going to cover a couple of different parameters. You don't have to include them all, but I'm going to cover all the ones that you typically might do. And we also need to get access to the uh, edge, the rear spring arm and the camera 3D. So we'll need to do that too. Um, so why don't we start with that? So we'll come back up. I'll do these in order. I'll keep the nodes up the top and then I'll do the um, other variables below them. So we'll have the edge spring arm and then the rear spring arm. And that'll be a spring arm 3D. And then we'll also have the camera and that is just camera 3D, right? And so that we can set these here, uh, rear spring up, make sure you're getting the right one and the camera 3D. And then we'll create a set of variables to control the aiming. So we'll have the aim rear spring length. It'll be a float and it will be equal to probably uh, 0.5. It, it might be a little bit too close to the character, but we'll go with that and we'll go aim uh, edge, spring length and it'll be a float and we'll make this also 0.5 we can change these as we've discussed and then we want the speed of the tween so uh, we'll call it aim speed and it'll be a float um, we'll make this equal to 0.2 seconds um, and then the last thing we want is the fov of the camera so aim fov and then that's also a float and it'll be equal to i'm going to make it 55 all right so we've got all of those values. Now we will actually need to keep track of their original values as well. So we'll do the exact same thing that we've done above. So we'll go on ready var default rear spring arm length via float and it'll also, and it'll be rear spring arm dot spring length. And then at on ready var default FOV, the float and it'll be equal to camera 
dot fov. All right, so just a note on all these on readies, um, you might think it's a little bit strange. Most times you see that, you'll see it with when people are dragging in a variable here. Uh, that doesn't look very good when they drag in a variable and create a path to a node, right? Um, but they can be used for things like this, where typically you would need to initialize this variable in the ready function because it exists as a property of this node. So uh, because these are path, they're not fully initialized until the ready function has been called in the node. So if you actually remove this, the game's not going to run. Uh, it'll error out and say that it's on a null value. So invalid access property or key spring length on base object of nil. Basically what that's trying to tell you is that the, the keyword spring length on this property uh, edge spring arm is nil because edge spring arm is null. It hasn't been set yet. So you have to put the on ready in front of it. I mean, alternatively, you could also set these variables up and then allocate them in the ready function would be the same thing functionally. So we've got those three variables. We should be good to go. Okay, let's come back down to our enter aim function. Now that we've got some properties to actually tween, we will be able to tween them. So we're going to, we've got our tween here and we can say camera tween dot tween property here. And I'm actually just going to copy this because we're going to be putting this in a couple of times here. And so what it wants is all the different parameters. So the first one is the camera and the path is the FOV. And then we can just go aim FOV and aim speed. And then the next property is going to be the, uh, we'll go with the edge spring arm. The property is the spring length. The position is the aim edge spring length and the duration is the aim speed. But that's going to be the same for every single one of them. Okay, last one, we've got the rear spring arm and the property is again the spring length and we want the aim rear spring length and the aim speed. Okay, All right. So that really is all we need, but we also want to be able to get out of this. So let's look at the exit aim function. And it's actually pretty similar to this. We could probably just make a copy of it. And the thing that we need to change is these values. So we just need to go to the default FOV, right? And this needs to be the default edge spring arm length. And this needs to be the default rear spring arm length. Okay. All right. So we've got our two functions here. Uh, now we just need to call them when we're pressing the button. So we'll say if event dot is action pressed aim, we're going to enter aim. And if event if event dot is action released aim, we will exit aim. Pretty straightforward. Let's see how it works. And you'll see it's actually pretty close. I don't know if I like it to be that close. That's that's pretty cozy. Our, our final model isn't going to look like this. So this might be appropriate later on, but right now that feels like a little bit much, right? So the uh, aim rear spring length, I think I want to raise that to 0.8, keep it a little bit further away. And in fact, you know what? I realized that I want it to be the other way around. I don't mind it being so close, but let's just get a little bit further away from the uh, from the character, if that makes sense. Uh, and you're not really feeling the 0.8. It's a, it's a very small distance for the edge spring arm because there's already one, so it's only 0.2. So you can't really see it, but it is there. Since we know when it was 0.5, we were much closer. And so you will find that this works pretty well. We can spam this input and it doesn't really cause any issues because we're working with predefined values. So this one's fine. It's not like the other one. When we tab them, we're able to create a bit of a problem with the, the spamming of the inputs. Now, you will find an issue. If we swap sides, right? And we go to aim, we end up on the wrong side. And then we come back to this. And the reason is because of what I was talking about before with this sign spring edge alarm length. So if we flip sides, the game doesn't really know which way it needs to be. We need to do the exact same thing that we're doing here where we're finding out which side the edge spring arm is and just going to it. So this negative sign edge spring arm dot spring length works really well. So what we can do is for the aim spring length, because it is a positive number, it's the same thing. We just need to multiply that um, 
So I was covering that up, multiply that by sine, and I'll make this a little bit bigger so we can see. Um, not the inverse though this time, we just want it to be whatever it is, we want what it to come out as, edge spring arm dot spring length. So we multiply that by sine and then do the same thing as down here. So we'll get default edge spring arm length multiplied by sine edge spring arm dot spring length. Okay, so if we run this now and we swap sides, it'll go to the right place. And generally, spamming these inputs generally still results in expected behavior. Obviously, when we're really close, we're passing through the character, which is a bit of a problem. We'll address that way later down the track when we have a, when we have a model attached to this, if, if it does happen. Um, we can always adjust the rear length as well uh, to prevent that from happening. So that is generally it. Um, it works pretty well, I would say. Um, like I said, spamming these inputs generally results in okay behavior. The thing with tweens is uh, we're not, and, and the thing with this as well, is we're not really preserving the state. So you have to be cognizant of the fact that all of these inputs can be called uh, whenever they're pressed and uh, be mindful of how you set this up and whether it or be mindful of when you're using tweens and um, setting up animations like this that they're going to behave in an expected way so because we're using predefined values and we're only using that one tween and we're killing it as soon as we go to the next action we're always going to end up in a place that we expect um, but i don't know this this looks okay to be honest um, if you were to the the thing the only issue that i see is if you intended to swap sides and then aim, if you don't wait until you're over the other side, you're gonna end up just here. And I don't know if I like that specifically. So we're gonna look at a solution for that. Um, but next we need to look at sprinting. All right, guys, I hope you found that helpful. Next week, we're going to be looking at controlling the sprinting action from the camera's perspective. If you're finding this series helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you want access to every single episode in the course, you can become a channel member or join the Patreon. Other than that, guys, I'll see you all next week.